Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your location. I'm Tuomas Välimäki, a member of the board here at the Bank of Finland. I'm responsible for markets, payment systems, and data management. Research also reports to me, and I also cover issues related to digitalization. Today, it's my pleasure to open the 2021 Bank of Finland Simulator Seminar. This is the 19th consecutive year we bring the community working on payment simulations and analysis together. So since 2003, our simulator seminars have provided a meeting place where the participants have been able to present their ongoing research and get fresh ideas for their work. Now, during the pandemic, we've observed several rapid changes in payment habits. Whereas the volume of banknotes in circulation has still increased, the trend decline in the use of cash as a mean of payment has been further accelerated. Currently, only 6% of Finns report cash as their main payment method for their daily transactions. The coronavirus has promoted the use of contactless payments at the point of sale, both by, by card and via mobile devices. Yet, card payments are likely to have peaked in popularity as mobile and instant payments are gaining more and more market shares. To put it short, based on the data we collected earlier this year from banks, consumers, and non-bank payment service providers, it seems obvious that paying in Finland is already now largely digital and this is not likely to change when the pandemic phase is over. If you are interested in our analysis on these issues, my colleagues will make the references available at the chat window. The deployment of instant payment is also of particular interest for central banks. Going towards real time, also in retail transactions, seems to be the new normal. But the transition is still on its way. In the Bank of Finland, we studied the liquidity implications that will result from the large-scale move from batch-based payments to real-time gross payments. The outcome of that work will be introduced in the Economics of Payments webinar in October. The Payment and Settlement System Simulator is a tool that can be utilized in many types of quantitative analysis of the payment and settlement systems. Since our last seminar, the, the development work with the both PSS2 simulator has been concentrated on the renewal of the user interface. Indeed, as the graphical user interface was redone completely, we thought it would be appropriate to label the latest version as a new generation. So our, our simulator is now called BOF or BOF PSS3. The new version is available for distribution and already being applied by some central banks. If you want to know about more about it, please contact our simulation team Tatu Laine or Kasperi Korpinen. Additionally, today you will hear about our latest simulation analysis done by using the new PSS3 version. We at the Eurosystem are enhancing the European financial market infrastructure. Target 2 payment system and the T2S security settlement system are going to be consolidated on a single platform. The project is ongoing and the new platform is scheduled to go live in November next year. Thanks to the consolidation, we also need to update the Eurosystem's environment used for Target 2 analysis and simulations. The Bank of Finland will deliver the simulation tool also to the renewed analytical environment. Actually, the realization phase of the project started earlier today, and the analytical tools should be ready in November 2022, simultaneously with the launch of the new production platform. Now, take your calendars out. The Bank of Finland will host the 10th Economic of Payments, Economics of Payments conference in October. The Economics of Payments is a regular academic uh, seminar that was last time organized by the BIS in 2018. 
This year, the conference will be organized as a series of virtual events during three afternoons from Wednesday the 20th until Friday the 22nd of October. The topics will range from retail payments to implications of the pandemic to fintechs, as well as from market infrastructure studies to the hot topic of CBDC. Two keynotes will be de delivered by Professor Kristin Parler on fintech competition and by Professor Dirk Niepelt on risks related to CBDCs. Economic digital currency is indeed a topic that has gained a lot of attention in the last years. This July, the Eurosystem initiated an investigation phase on digital euro. If issued at some point in time, the digital euro would be the third form of central bank money, in addition to banknotes and banks' RTGS balances. We have long experience in simulating CBDC, but a wholesale version of it, that is the RTGS balances. If retail CBDCs were to be issued in the future, it would call for new uh, type of quantitative analysis and it's likely to bring a growing number of use cases for simulation tools. Today's agenda is compact, yet extremely interesting. There will be five presentations in this webinar, including a keynote by Professor J. Doyle Farmer. We hope that next year we can cater for more presentations in a live event in Helsinki. I want to thank all the speakers and people involved in organizing this event. There are close to 100 registered participants to this webinar, and you represent 28 nationalities from five different continents. To me, that's impressive. So I wish you all a fruitful webinar. Thank you. And now to Kasperi. Uh, thank you, Thomas, very much. <laughs> So just uh, to start, we'll go through a little bit of uh, the code of conduct that uh, we'll be following during this uh, uh, seminar. And um, meet, uh, please keep yourself muted during the presentations and turn off your videos. And uh, if you want to uh, wish to speak or present questions, uh, please use the raise hand function or, or the chat to ask questions. Uh, the event will be recorded and we will publish it uh, in, uh, in BOF's YouTube channel. Uh, the hashtags we will be using is the simulator seminar and uh, buff simulator that you can see here under. So today's uh, program, we will uh, start with um, Professor uh, Doyle Farmer. Uh, Professor Doyle Farmer is a director of the Complexity Economics Program at the Institute for New Economic Thinking at Oxford Martin School. Uh, he is also uh, Bailey Gifford Professor in the Mathematical Institute at the University of Oxford. Uh, he has also other uh, affiliations and an uh, impressive track record in the published uh, studies. Uh, his current research is in economics, including agent-based modeling, financial instability, and technological progress. His past research includes complex systems, dynamical systems uh, theory, time series analysis, and theoretical biology. Um, before giving uh, the voice to Mr. Uh, Doyen Farmer, uh, I think uh, he's joining us now from um, uh, New York, so this is uh, uh, really typical to our seminars, it seems that the people are participating from all around the corners of the world. So, uh, 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 Mr. Farmer Doin, uh, we received your um, presentation, so I will now have to open it. So, one moment. Uh, right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay, we're off and running here. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Let me just say it's more my fault than the conference organizer because uh, I only sent them the slides 10 minutes ago. So please, let's go ahead. Uh, and so I'm going to I'm going to present an overview of, of a, a set of things we're doing to simulate the economy. I'm going to begin with just a few broad remarks because, you know, you can't think about the financial system independently of the rest of the economy, as we saw with COVID, which 
could end up having big implications for the rest of the economy. Uh, next slide. You know, I think it's useful to take a step back and think about what is the economy. Uh, in complex system style, I'd argue it's the metabolism of civilization that converts natural resources and human effort into goods and services, coordinates and amplifies the activities of ecologies of specialists. And uh, next slide. Um, and I think it's particularly helpful to think about the economy as a system of interacting as specialists, as, as an ecosystem. Uh, you know, companies are specialists, workers are specialists. You really need to think about these with bounded rationality, and you need to think about them as an ecosystem of networks. Uh, next slide. And we've been in my group at Oxford, uh, you know, let me maybe just make a step back from what I was about to say. Maybe eight years ago, we tried to just build a model of the economy in one big go. And we basically decided in the end that was too ambitious. And so we've scaled back and we're building a model of the economy in chunks and each, each part of it building separate models, trying to calibrate these models independently of each other, but build them so that we can snap them together and use them together when we need to uh, and when we've already calibrated the individual pieces as best we can, uh, doing the pieces independently. So in this picture I'm showing here, you can think about the central part is the, the input output network, the production network of the economy. Uh, and then we have other components like the labor market that uh, I show below that. And then um, th this picture was actually drawn more with a focus on climate and geography where we also have to think about the global energy system up at the top, about uh, innovation and technological change, about investment, and about, in the case of the climate, green competitiveness. And, uh, and then, as I said, we're developing all these separately, but putting them together. Next slide. So we began with the production network, and let me just say, the give you the overview of the talk. I'm gonna go through each of these pieces very, very quickly. And then I'm gonna zoom in to the investment module and the financial system in particular, and spend the rest of my talk talking about that. So I'm gonna go through some slides now very, very quickly. So just to give you the, 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 the you know, 50,000 foot overview. So next slide, we begin by focusing on the production network, which, you know, as we know from COVID is very complicated. Here we see just the physical supply chain of a laptop, which is only, which, which you know, is seven layers of deep, spans the world, uh, takes years for the pieces to flow from one to another. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, we've used a Leontief approach to building this. And um, I'm going to just flip through all this, just, slide so next slide this is just to give you a feeling for the ecology of production and just the united states economy itself this is dividing the economy only into 40 parts we already see how incredibly complicated the production network is uh, next slide and so we've used this leontia framework which um, i'm not going to go into any depth if, if you're familiar with it you, these equations may look somewhat familiar. Next slide. Uh, we made an analogy to food webs. Next slide. Uh, so here's a food web of a real ecosystem where you see things go into layers based on what eats whom. So at the top, you have top predators. And at the bottom, you have things that do photosynthesis. And you see here an ecosystem of a lake arranged in the layers of what eats what. Uh, next slide. We've done the, the concept of trophic levels in ecosystems captures a concept in network theory called node centrality that's you know essential for things like page rank and ecology at trophic level in economics. This turns into the output multiplier. Next slide. Okay, you see here what we've done is we've arranged the output multipliers of the economy. 
um, at a level of about 40 industries for China on one side and the US on the other side. And right away, you can see at a glance how different the economies are. And this is reflecting real differences in the way they're structured. In China, manufacturing is the biggest part of the economy and uh, it's uh, the big nodes are in manufacturing and they're up at the top of the diagram. In the US, services are the big part of the economy and they're down at the bottom part of the diagram because services have lower output multipliers, lower trophic levels. Um, next slide. Um, you know, the division of labor implies a division of innovation. If you're making a laptop, for example, you inherit all the improvements that all of your suppliers make. If chip manufacturers make a major breakthrough, then you inherit that and that ultimately makes the cost of the laptop cheaper. But if, you know, um, uh, uh, a key element like silicon becomes cheaper. You inherit that too. You inherit the product of all the innovations along the way, and you inherit those multiplicatively. Next slide. And we've made a simple model of technological change that when a, an improvement's made, you get the same input, but cheaper than before. Next slide. Uh, and we've actually used that to make a prediction about progress of industries this is showing over a 14 year span, the improvements in the price indices of global industries where here, here each dot is a given industry in a given country. And you see that on average as the trophic level, that is the output multiplier of the industry increases, the rate of improvement increases along with it. Uh, next slide. Now, so I'm gonna jump to the next network, which is the occupational labor network. Um, which is the one sitting below it. Next slide. Um, we've used ideas from network theory and thinking about the job space in terms of tasks using the ONET data space, ONET database to build up a description of what we, that we call the job space that arranges jobs, ranges different occupations next to other occupations that perform similar tasks and that Next slide captures the mobility of of um, of occupations. It also makes it possible to think about things like wages, education, gender, automation, pollution, all side by side and see how it's affecting different components of the job space. And so you can see here that the say construction part of the job space, which is down in the lower left corner, it's uh, uh, predominantly medium wage, uh, lower education, dominated by males, um, uh, highly susceptible to automation, and more pollution intensive. You can see at a glance that that part of the job space is affected that way. Next slide. And if you want to think about unemployment, which varies dramatically by profession, here we see a histogram of, of uh, occupational unemployment rates at a particular point in time in the US. On the right, you see extremely high uh, unemployment for actors, uh, for boilermakers, several other occupation on, sorry, that's on the right side of the histogram. On the left side, for nurses, the unemployment rate is 0.2%. So vastly different unemployment rates. Next slide. Um, and so here you see how unemployment looks in the job space. Again, you see unemployment rates tend to be higher down in that production part of the diagram and lower uh, in the like healthcare uh, sector, which is up in the upper right and has many of the opposite characteristics to the uh, uh, construction sector, production sector down in the left. Next slide. Um, we can also think about occupational mobility. How is it, how easy is it for uh, workers in a given occupation to change jobs? And when they do, which occupation do they transition into? Actually, you can use tasks to predict occupational mobility. Uh, it makes a reasonable prediction of that. Next slide. 
and uh, this is classifying based on communities or based on the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics. Next slide. And we've built a, a simulation model of occupational unemployment where we, um, you see the, the transition diagram for workers and for job vacancies. And um, we it's a very simple, simple model where workers, um, you know, when workers become unemployed, they apply for jobs in all of the occupations that they historically other people have transitioned into, which allows you us to think about job frictions and the difficulty of transitioning from um, one occupation to the next and through um, dislocations like autom an automation shock. And next slide. We also get certain things for free, like this is what's called the beverage curve, where we plot vacancies against unemployment. This actually wasn't what we were trying to do when we started out in this model, but we discovered that you know there's a strong uh, hysteresis between uh, as a recession's building, the vacancy rate at, at a given level of unemployment is very different than it is as the economy's rebuilding at the same unemployment rate when the economy is rebuilding you're on the upper component of this diagram and you require more vacancies to get to the same level of unemployment uh, next slide and so here we see the models fit um, on the, the dash curve that's outlined in green to the beverage curve and you see that we actually capture the shape and the direction one moves around the beverage curve as we go through a um, a, uh, a business cycle. So next slide. And, you know, having a model like this allowed us to think about the impact of COVID on the UK economy, because in order to uh, uh, think about this, we've understood the relationship between the production network on one side and which workers work in which industries and so we could use data in the ONET statistics to predict a priori how the shock, COVID shock, was going to affect the economy and uh, simulate both the effect on production and with a more dynamical model than the one I showed you before, uh, by understanding which industries were gonna be shut down because we knew how the COVID shock would affect different occupations. And so we were able to predict that a priori. So we were able to predict what the shock would be and which we did very successfully for the first quarter of the impact on the UK economy. Next slide. Um, green competitiveness. I think I'm going to just skip this because I want to get the financial part. So let's skip this slide and the next slide and go to the third slide. Let's skip this one. And we've also done a lot of thinking about innovation te and technology. And next slide, and our ability to predict patenting rates. This is a paper with Tony Pickler. Next slide, where you know we we think about patents as a bipartite network, where we can think use the citation matrix in the patent space to use uh, the network of of um, technology categories that are cited by a given technology category to actually predict what patenting rates are going to be going forward. So let's uh, skip several slides to get to the last slide in this series here. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Let me, so let's pause on this one. This just shows a comparison of our predictions using an unconditional prediction of independent of each patenting category one at a time versus using the whole patenting network to predict each category and showing that we can actually improve our predictions by thinking about the whole network and actually we can predict up to 10 years ahead uh, with uh, what i found to be surprising accuracy what patenting rates are going to be using this approach next slide okay energy system again i want to get to finance here because i'm conscious i'm, I'm about to run out of time so i'm going to skip over the energy system uh, uh, let me just say that we've mapped out the energy system in great detail and 
used uh, its history to, pre to predict going forward. So let's skip several slides here. That just shows our prediction, which uh, allows us to make predictions, not just uh, point predictions, but actually statistical predictions, which has been done by forecasting lots of different technologies using a method that Francois Lafond and I developed. Next slide. And, and this has allowed us to estimate the cost of the transition and show that um, a rapid green energy transition that is transitioning to an essentially carbon-free economy in 20 years is actually, uh, in our prediction, the cheapest a path to take. So we just have to prod the world a little bit more and then various efficiencies kick in and we should drive energy prices much cheaper than they've ever been. Next slide. So now uh, let me let me uh, I'm a little worried about the time, but let me just say a bit about the ecology of financial markets. Next slide. So we've developed a model for how market ecology can be used to explain market malfunctions. Next slide. Um, that going beyond the theory of market efficiency, you know, prices fully reflect fundamental values according to market efficiency. Uh, you know, I'm with Fisher Black. I believe in efficient markets in the sense that prices were, are within a factor of two of fundamental values 90% of the time. Um, and markets are efficient at first order, but necessarily inefficient at second order because if there weren't inefficiencies there, there wouldn't be any arbitrageurs to take advantage of them. And uh, so this, what I'll, the next few slides I'll go into a bit more detail in, are illustrating how the, uh, if we assume that markets are by definition inefficient and think about the specializations that strategies have and how strategies affect each other, then we can better understand why markets malfunction and why they're inefficient. Um, next slide. So, you know, in an ecological analogy to financial markets, investment strategies correspond to species. The wealth invested in a strategy corresponds to the abundance or the population of that species. And um, it's important to take into account the fact that wealth of strategies evolves through time significantly in response to their profits and losses and in depending on their interactions with each other. That is, whether or not a given strategy makes profits depends on the other strategies that are present in the, in the financial system at a given point in time. Next slide. So here we see uh, which strategy is most profitable. So uh, uh, blue for if um, when uh, uh, value investors are most profitable, or, or sorry, wait just a minute, I have to remember. Yes, blue when the value investor is most profitable, red when the noise trader is most prof profitable, and green when trend followers are most profitable. So we've arranged things on this based on the wealth of each of these. So in the lower right corner, we have, uh, well, in the upper, upper corner, we have a, a, a financial ecosystem where we have nothing but um, trend followers. In the lower left, we have a financial ecosystem where we have nothing but noise traders, and in the lower right, we have a system where we have nothing but value investors. And you can see as you move around this diagram, like if you're in the bottom part of the diagram, where trend, trend followers are relatively, uh, have relatively little wealth in the financial ecosystem, then uh, we see that trend followers do well. Similarly, when value investors have less wealth, they do well. And when noise traders have less wealth, they do well. And up at the top, you have a complicated region because if you have a financial ecosystem with too many trend followers, the whole financial system becomes unstable. And that will be one of the things we'll focus on on this in the next few slides. Next slide. Um, you can arrange the different types of investors in a market food web based on who profits from the presence of other investors. Uh, I won't go into detail on that. Next slide. Um, 
you can study market dynamics. In this case, we see, we track and the, the black uh, trajectory you see below the relative wealth of these different three types of investors through time. The black dot shown as the equilibrium that they asymptotically evolved towards, but there's significant fluctuations away from that equilibrium. So in the panel, the upper panel, you see um, uh, the volatility and you see uh, the, the panel below that, you see mispricing and you see a prediction of that based on just doing a linear regression of the relative wealth of trend followers, value investors, and noise traders. And you see that if, if, um, if you actually know how many trend followers there are and how many value investors there are, or at least how much wealth each of those groups have, how many noise traders there are, you can do a, a pretty darn good job in this simulated ecosystem of predicting how volatile the market will be and how large the mispricings between fundamental values and um, prices are at any given point in time uh, and the relative proportion of trend followers and value investors is the main predictor of those changes. So next slide. Um, we believe that if we, if we could apply this in real life, uh, we could help practitioners understand the co-evolving financial landscape. Why do some strategies make more profits at a given point in time? And that regulators could use this to understand the likely outcome of regulation, monitor stability, and intervene where necessary. And we're in the process of actually testing this with uh, some of the regulatory data that is kept in the US. Um, next slide. Uh, now I'm gonna just mention a couple of papers uh, that, that recent papers that we have where we take uh, this idea and we lift it up to make simulators that allow us to, to simulate the financial system uh, in more detail. Uh, this, this first paper is done jointly with the Bank of England. Next slide. Um, it's really driven by Alyssa Kleinogen Weiss as the main co-author. It's a Python-based simulation. Uh, uh, the, the, the basic engine is also available in C++. With a library online, there's five building blocks based on financial contracts, markets, financial institutions, uh, binding constraints and behavior, though in this model, we generally use fairly simple models of behavior. And next slide. Uh, these, we simulate hedge funds, banks, and asset managers, and we simulate the balance sheets at the level I've shown here. Uh, um, next slide. And with this framework, we can do policy experiments like compare, we can look at a macro prudential overlay to the EBA 2018 stress test. So we, we look at the same institutions that they stress tested, but instead of stress testing them one at a time, and we take the shock that was imposed on all these institutions, and we can look at the systemic effects of the institutions and their interactions with each other. And in the um, left slide, you see uh, what happens when you have just the EBA stress test without any of the interactions between the different institutions. And in the orange curve in that left slide, you see what happens when you include the interactions and, um, and under a disorderly liquidation versus a contagion-free, very controlled liquidation, you can see the disorderly liquidations a lot worse. Next slide. Um, you can also look at how different contagion mechanisms uh, for financial, for financial uh, uh, contagion interact with each other and amplify what each other does and make the next result much greater than it is when uh, you consider them one at a time, as has been typically done in most uh, uh, macro prudential uh, stress models. And so in the left picture, for example, you see 
the what happens when you have all the contagion mechanisms combined together versus uh, you know one contagion mechanism at a time. So by contagion mechanism, I mean something like uh, funding contagion uh, due to the inability to get funding, exposure loss due to having the people you lend to uh, lose lose overlapping portfolio contagion, uh, collateral contagion. And so we can actually break down each of those components. Next slide. And we've also done a study of what happens under bail-in. Next slide. Again, with Alyssa leading. And I'll just say some of the overview of the results. We can look at um, different ways of constructing a bail-in mechanism and see how well bail-in works under different, when the parameters for dealing with bail-in are set in different ways. Again, we use the EBA uh, stress test as an example, and we look at what happens when uh, uh, contagion is evolved through bail-in as opposed to other mechanisms, and when it works and when it doesn't work. And so uh, I'm out of time. Next slide. Uh, let me just say we're in the process of putting these components together to build a global economic simulator, in particular focusing on the input-output network, the labor market, and the financial system as the key dynamic components. Next slide. And uh, trying to um, uh, build build this out, as, I, as I've tried to illustrate piecemeal, and the final slide. Just to say that you know the economy can be simulated. We're sort of tackling this one component at a time, and I think we are heading towards a domain in in, a, in really literally just a few years, where we can simulate with some accuracy the key components of the economy, and go beyond the uh, kind of ability to predict that we have from DSG models and CGE models and the other competing equilibrium mechanisms. So on that, I'm, I'm out of time. I, I'm i worried I'm we might not have any time for questions, but um, I'd be happy to take them if we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, uh, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, I will allow for uh, time for a few questions. And uh, so if meanwhile, Tato, you can, I need to rearrange my windows for teams here. So if you could uh, maybe lead for the questions or the look after questions that might be there. So. Okay, not, no, no questions so far in, in chat, but. Uh... <laughs> okay. Uh, any, yeah, now I, I'm back on uh, my old screen. So I wonder, uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, need your hands raised here um yeah so actually your presentation don if if uh, i take the lead here um is very interesting and actually very close to my heart uh, as uh, as uh, already uh, from the name of this seminar we are very simulation oriented and uh, uh i have a one leg, which is very strongly on the computer science side, and uh, agent-based modeling is also close, close to my heart philosophically and methodologically. And uh, this is actually one of the dreams we have had also uh, to is to expand actually our simulator to to an economic simulate simulator, more large one. Uh, we have been during the year, years uh, facing also this. Uh, uh, issues uh, where we have heard about the issues people have been saying when uh, they have been trying to do these things and uh, uh, and um, I think this leads to a few questions that precisely you mentioned the uh, DSGE and um, and this uh, traditional way of doing and and uh, but uh, in, in your modeling so you are relaxing this equilibrium uh, hypothesis or are you like uh, performing these um, simulations or more like uh, mimicking uh, economical actions, uh, let's say in the economics. So, are you making this, uh, let's say, a very uh, real simulator, or are you still uh, staying at the level of uh, abstraction, like uh, using a lot of uh, uh, economic um, assumptions or, or equations uh, in the traditional way? Like, for example, in the DSGE models, you have this uh, 
uh, balance uh, equilibrium constraints still up there if if I haven't been mistaken and but uh, it's like we participated to a agent based modeling uh, seminar a few years ago with Tatu and and uh, they were a lot of uh, people were keeping these assumptions in the models and uh, we were arguing uh, against them that uh, this should be relaxed altogether and um, that uh, we should actually test those assumptions and uh, model like uh, real transactions in the economy and uh, and uh, give a budget to families and uh, and let these uh, uh, persons uh, consume in the model like it will be more in the real economy so can you say something on, on this yes so i think you know we we exactly agree with you we we've relaxed all those assumptions we don't have utility maximizers we don't have um uh you know we are not computing first order conditions under the assumption that everybody's optimizing their utility uh we instead are just simulating what happens things get produced things get consumed uh people have jobs people get paid for their work and they use the money they get paid for their work to consume and if they get unemployed they're not getting paid and they're not consuming and so we're modeling that dynamic feedback loop in in these models and similarly in the financial models that i showed you at the end we assume that banks have portfolios that if they have a portfolio of loans they have a portfolio of investments if they get uh, come under some stress the they're forced to sell off things in those portfolios selling them off causes market impact drives prices down devalues everybody else's portfolio causes them to sell as well or equivalently or not equivalently but but in parallel they may have loans out when their balance sheet gets stressed they may stop giving out those loans if they stop giving out those loans they affect other institutions credit and so these effects all propagate through the economy so the models are dynamic and they allow these effects to propagate in realistic ways now um, the challenge in these kind of models is to get data that's good enough that you can calibrate the model against the data um, so in both of the financial stress models we've you know we're only able to do this when we're able to collaborate with regulatory institutions that give us access to data that normal people don't have. So we've been able to do that working with the Bank of England uh, and actually with a bank of, we're doing a model now with a bank of South Africa. Um, uh, when we've been modeling the real economy, again, we're gated by our access to data, but uh, you know we've set up the model to do the best we can with the publicly available data. But the reason for breaking things into components, as I did in this presentation, is because of that problem of calibrating things. And you know, so as I said, we we work by calibrating each piece separately, but then putting them together when we when we can. I think that's the right strategy to to approach this kind of building this kind of model, which uh, which can be said that they are kind of huge, and I think that leaves also possibility for cooperating with uh, other organizations, also in the sense that you can uh, share maybe uh, responsibilities on who will program what part and uh, and so on. So it will maybe facilitate uh, this kind of larger working. Uh, environment also but uh, we have a question here from uh, Kainu uh, please I try to unmute you uh, thanks okay yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is Jan Kainu, I'm from Jan. the local resolution authority um, you mentioned that the bailings can be stabilizing if they are well designed could you elaborate a bit on that what is typical of well designed bailing and, and what's typical of uh, less well designed bailing yeah so a less well-designed bail-in has just to give we're the seven different parameters and uh for that we've studied the effect of but for example um uh this how well capitalized is the bail-in are the institutions well capitalized enough that they're not going to just fail again once they're stood back up how rapidly is the bail-in applied a bail-in that's applied in a very timely manner is much more effective than a bail-in that's applied in a slow manner. 
Uh, so many of these are kind of intuitive uh, in their overall effect, but the devils are in the details of what are the actual size of these effects and, and the effects work in tandem with each other so that um, the model that we have allows us to study these in a quantitative way. And what we've seen is that if you look at the parameters of the bail ends that have typically been applied, they're dangerous and that they may work if you have a relatively small and self-contained financial crisis. But once things get bigger and more systemic, uh, the parameters for the bail ends are just not set aggressively enough to, to uh, uh, solve the problems and can actually make things worse rather than better. So, uh, but the, po the paper is posted online at a, as a C CEPR preprint with my collaborator, Alyssa Kleinogen Weiss as co-author. And so you can go through the effect of all of the seven parameters that we studied uh, in, in that paper. Okay. So I think right. we, we have used a lot of time now uh, and we need to uh, move forward. Uh, I, I see that, uh, I think we could have uh, continued the discussion for a long time on, the, on this, as this is touching a lot of uh, aspects of of the economy and uh, if not all, <laughs> like you said in, in your presentation. Uh, okay, thank you, Don, very much uh, once more, Don. It was very interesting. Hopefully I thank have you. the time to, to get to, into your uh, presentation as well, <laughs> more deeply in someday. <laughs> okay, so next uh, we'll have a presentation from the direction of Belgium. Uh, Nigel Smart will be presenting. Hi. Uh, and um, is this, uh, I was looking at your um, affiliation, which is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, uh, that uh, I think the the COSIC was uh, accounting for Computer Security and Industrial Cryptography Group, uh, yeah. which is part of or under uh, the Catholic University of Leuven or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Oh, please, yeah. you have the floor. Okay. Right. So, um, first, first up, um, I'm not an economist, as you can see. I'm kind of a computer scientist. So, um, and what we're talking about, um, if you type in this URL, you can get the paper. Okay. So, what we're talking about is liquidity matching, um, and I'll kind of. So, basically. We've got some banks and they want to execute some transactions um, and they're thing called uh, uh, grid. So we can have a gridlock or deadlock. OK, so we can either execute the transactions immediately or it might be that there's, um, you know, this is where you execute it immediately because the banks have the, um, uh, the liquidity already to do it. Um, and then we have this issue called gridlock. So this is what was given to us by the European Central Bank. And so apparently, I know nothing about banking, I know nothing about economics, but apparently this is currently done by the Central Bank. It can kind of go, OK, there is a problem. Uh, we can resolve this and we can, um, there is enough liquidity in the system to solve the problem, but we each pair of banks cannot solve the problem individually. You need the global view to solve um, uh, allocation of the of, of the transactions. Okay, then deadlock. There's not enough liquidity, so you have to wait until there's either more liquidity to generate into the system or not. Okay, so we have these things called uh, liquidity saving mechanisms. Um, uh, there's a reference in a minute of, for the algorithm we're going to use. And the ECB wants to know: Could you actually run this without a central authority seeing all the data? So that was the question, and this is what we're trying to answer in this talk and in this paper. Um, so it's basically, it's a discrete um, uh, optimization problem. Um, and what we want to do is maximize the number of transactions to be settled based on the balances that the participants should never go negative, a bank should never go bust, no shit Sherlock, and um, the order of priority of settling the payments, um, which is preferred by the bank should be pre preserved. We kind of took an order of priority of uh, first in, first out, just because it's simpler, but there could be other ones, okay. So there is a solution this, um, due to the two people at the top. Um, so it's maximizing the number of payers by pick, uh, payments by picking a queue from each bank. 
But to do this, you have to see the queue of transactions from every bank. And the question from the ECB was, could you actually do this with actually invisibly, without actually anyone seeing all the, any transactions at all, completely privately? OK, so why would you want to do this? Well, if you wanted to kind of some sort of decentralized ledger technology system, you haven't got a central bank to allocate resources. If you were using the DLT to kind of replace RTGS, which some central banks have been playing out. I mean, I, I talked to the, got the Bank of England about this, God knows how many years ago, maybe eight, nine years ago. Now they were thinking about that. Um, you would have no central authority who would be able to do this, but you'd still need to do liquidity matching because otherwise but, uh, can, transactions would not complete. So what we want to do is we want to run the gridlock resolution problem without this, um, this the, the bank in the middle seeing everything, okay? So we want to run it as a protocol. So we run a protocol for running the gridlock resolution problem such that each individual bank does not learn what the transactions are of the other banks. So this kind of seems to be a dichotomy that we have to solve, okay? So what we want, we want that it's correct, that you know if you have a, a transaction debited from one account, um, from a from a, from a source is the same as the amount that's going to be transferred to the destination account. Um, it should be fair in that it's not going to favour one uh, party or another. And what we want is we want security. So this is why we're involved because we're a security group. Um, is that transaction information between two entities? So for example, party one and party two. Any transaction information between party one and party two should not leak to party three, which you seem to need if you have to have a global view. OK. The idea is, is we can use this magic technology to, called multi-party computation. So what does multi-party computation do? OK, it's kind of cool. It basically takes a central authority and replaces it with a protocol. So if you have any property where you have a central authority, you can do a protocol. So this has been used in uh, many it's got a quite a number of applications already in finance. It's been used for auctions. Um, it's been used for market clearance, um, stock markets and things like that. Um, it's been uh, promoted by the Financial Conduct Authority in London as a way of, of dealing with anti-money laundering. US government, whether they're equivalent of the F FSA, also was looking at this. Um, there was a big tech sprint in London to use MPC for AML um, or about two years ago, just before COVID. Um, so there's been, oh, there's a lot of work on this technology within the financial sector. Um, but the question is, can you apply it to this, this kind of uh, liquidity matching problem? Okay, so what do we do? So what the actual technical definition is, is that you have these parties, they have some input, and they learn the output of the function, whatever the function is, but no one learns the input bar what you can infer from the output. So. It's kind of, you basically run an algorithm, you take an algorithm and you can run it securely such that each party doesn't learn what each other's input is, except for what they would learn anyway from the output. Okay, and the way we're going to do this is using what's called a secret share scheme, which is not important, so I'm going to skip over this. Um, ba -ba -ba, skip over that, it's not important. Okay, so we're going to run a gridlock to close resolution problem. So we're going to, this is, We've got three things in a transaction. We've got the source, the destination, and the amount. Okay. And the question is, is what do we want to keep secret? Now we're going to assume that always we keep the transaction amount secret. Okay. We kind of we don't want um, uh, Germany to know that the France has paid Finland uh, a, a gazillion euros or something like that. Okay. However, we could leak that. France has paid uh, Finland something, but we don't know what. In that case, if we leak the source and destination addresses, we're going to call this SODO, because source open, destination open, but the amount of the transaction secret. So this is like the weakest form of security, but it will make our algorithms go faster. If we think of source open, where we, we learn that France has paid someone something, but we don't know whether it was to Finland, whether it's to Greece, whether it was to Germany or whatever. We're going to call that SODS, source open destination secret. And everything's secret, if both the source is secret, the destination secret, and the amount's secret, we're going to call, keep that SSDS, 
So always amounts are going to be secret and always the balances are secret. So you're never going to learn that Finland's about to run out of money or not, that Finland's very rich and it's all the other countries going to run out of money. OK, OK, so that's going forward. The definition of what we mean by we've got three different levels of security because this allows us to see how things go on. OK, so how are we actually going to um, run it? So uh, the kind of algorithms on the right, but let's not worry about that. What we actually think of this stuff on that. So what we have to do is we have to calculate all uh, the balances um, uh, th for the banks after the transactions in the queue have been executed. So if we uh, if we look at this square bracket notation means the thing in the square bracket is secret, then we can if we run over if the source is open and the destination, the source location and the receiving location are in the clear. Then the only only value is um, uh, is is um, is the amount. Then we can kind of execute. Uh, we can work out how much is being sent, how much is being received by all banks, and then update the balances in a secure manner, relatively straightforward, by just executing these very simple sums, where we have some sort of variable which kind of uh, acts like a multiplexer. Okay, now that's the that's the SOGO, that's the easy case. So. It doesn't matter if you don't understand the slide. The next, the point is, is that when we keep the destination secret, if the destination suddenly becomes secret, then we get extra problems here. So this receiving thing goes from one multiplication to two. So things get more complicated the more things you keep secret. And if you want to keep the source secret, then this line changes and you get an extra multiplication there. So just things get more complicated the more things you keep secret. That's the key point. Once we've, up, once we've computed these balances, which we can do in the three different algorithms, all we then have to do is find what these new balances, is any bank in the negative? If a bank is in the negative, then, this, then we've got a problem. So what we do is we now delete one of the transactions from the pending transaction queue from one of the banks that's gone negative. And then we run it again. We test whether all the banks are in uh, positive and we stop as soon as we're in all banks positive territory it's a standard algorithm so it's kind of it's kind of pr pretty straightforward um and this is the algorithm to run it and, and and whatever okay so what do we do we had um we uh looked at this source open destination open problem and source open destination secret these first two these are the two easy cases and what we see is that we ran these are actual runtime so what we did is we simulated a a bunch of banks n up to a thousand banks and a given number of transactions to be processed this is the number of transactions in a queue that you want to suddenly clear okay and the way we did this is that, remember, we're replacing this central authority. So instead of uh, what we did is we replaced this central authority by a distributed authority, which has three parties. So it kind of gives you a form of security whereby if I'm um, if I've got the 27 or however many banks in the Eurozone, 27, I think, if you have 27 banks in the Eurozone, they basically nominate three parties to execute the protocol on their behalf. And it's secure, for example, Finland might say it trusts um, entity A and entity B not to uh, be corrupt, whereas France might trust entity B and entity A, uh, entity B and entity C. OK, so they can each have different trust relationships with the three, but as long as they trust, say, two of them to be non-corrupt, only one's going to be bad, then you can kind of uh, assume this is you, you, the whole protocol is secure. So to repeat, we've got 27 organizations. They put their data into these three zones that are actually doing the computation. But each party trusts, doesn't trust all three parties to be uh, to be completely untrustworthy. What they do, though, is that they trust. At least only one of them is going to be bad. So, for example, if it was Amazon, Google and Microsoft, it might be that France don't trust Microsoft, but they trust Amazon and Google and so on. So this would main this is what maintains security is by distributing trust. OK, so in that situation, if we keep the source open and the destination open, but keep all the balances and all the amounts secret, 
what we see is is the number of banks increases. Um, we essentially get no 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 uh, performance improvement, uh, no performance degradation. Um, and it would take it takes about five seconds to clear a queue of two hundred um, transactions. So why do we not have an, uh, a, a degradation? Well, it's kind of obvious is that the source and the destination are actually in the clear. So it doesn't matter. We're not keeping anything secret. OK, in the source and destination, we're only keeping amount secret. However, as soon as we put keep the destination secret, the runtimes decrease quite dramatically. OK, so it would take uh, here about 10 seconds to clear. Well, 500, uh, uh, if you have 500 banks and 100 transactions, it would take 10 seconds to clear everything. Okay. So, and, it, and it's becoming more complex because we're keeping the destination secret and there's more possible destinations. There's here, there's 500 possible destinations. We don't know which one is which. Okay. But this is for a given fixed value of transactions. Very important to bear that in mind. We'll bet, come back to that in a minute. And if we keep everything secret, it gets worse. So if we want to compare 500, so what last time we looked at 500 uh, banks and 100 transactions in the queue, it took about 10 seconds here. 500 transactions, 500 banks, sorry, 100 transactions, it's taken over 40 seconds. So, okay. So that's what happens if we want run one execution of the algorithm. And this is why the next stage is why it's going to be interesting for this audience. Okay. So the point is, is we don't execute one transaction. We keep doing this over a day. So the value of transactions in the queue are going to vary over the day. And the amount that's going to be in the queue varies on the transaction sizes, the amounts and the liquidity in the system. So to understand whether this protocol, this secure protocol actually would make sense, what we have to do is we have to simulate a whole day's transactions. So what we did is we used a simulation by Soromaki and Cook, I hope that's how you pronounce the name, um, from 2013, which um, apparently came out of, out, out of Finland. So we're kind of using, using this one. Um, to simulate transactions and to see what happens in, 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 in as, the, as the algorithm runs. So what does it do is it simulates these transactions of source, amount and destination um, from, uh, a, from a set of uh, banks where um, you pick them from a graph, which is basically a scale free graph. OK, so you basically um, there's some preferred nodes. Um, which, you know, like the big, this, for example, if it was the 27 banks of the Eurozone, I would suspect a lot would go through Germany. So Germany's like a preferred node. There's going to be lots of stuff going through Germany and maybe not that much activity with, mm, I've got to find a small country that's in the Eurozone. I don't want to insult anybody that isn't very economically active, so I'm not going to mention a small country, so whatever. Um, imagine there's a small country um, that's really, really tiny. Okay, um, Grand Fennec, for those that kind of, no old 1950s movies um, would be an example of a European country that's very small. OK. OK, so this is the uh, details of the algorithm. Somehow the PowerPoint's gone wrong, but you can kind of look this up. It's kind of this, this is how the simulation works. OK, so the, here's what we want to do is the algorithm is going to be depend how, it, how long it runs, how big these queues are going to get during the day are going to depend on the amount of uh, 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 liquidity in the system. We're going to control the liquidity by simulation parameters. So we control the amount of liquidity going through the system. This allows us to estimate how big this queue is as we go through the day. So what do we do? We first generate the transactions using the distribution of the simulator, and then just we kind of distribute them over one hour at uniform time intervals. Okay, so we're only going to emulate an hour's worth of transactions. And we have three algorithms to clear the transactions. We have three secure variants of the algorithms. We have the SODO, the SODS, and the SSDS, okay? Okay, and we're going to process them in two different ways. In the first version, what is going to happen is, is as a transaction comes in, we're actually going to process it, okay? And and, and then we're going to have, um, it, that's going to give us a delay because it's going to take a while to process the transaction or the set of transactions that we've got. So if we've got 100 transactions in the queue, one comes in, we now process those 101 transactions. Okay. At that point, we might have now 
80 transactions in the queue, but it's taken us three seconds. In that time period, another five have come in, and we just then process them one at a time as they come in. That's method one. In method two, we take the transactions, and then after we've got, we process 101, we've got maybe 80 left, and then another five have come in. Now we've got 85, and we just add 85 straight in, and we process 85 at once. So there's two different ways you could deal with the delay. Do you deal with them sequentially as they come in one by one, or do you kind of take into account that during your time of execution of three seconds, five have come in, so you add those five in as you go. And now what we want to do is we want to see how much time did it take to process the hour's worth of transactions? So there's two measures we can do. We can take the excess time, which is the time it took to do everything minus an hour, because an hour would be the time it would take if everything happened instantaneously. OK, or we look at what is the average delay per transaction over the hour. Now, obviously, equals zero is perfect in that there is no delay over the hour. No, no things are going to back up. And D equals zero is perfect in the sense that each transaction clears immediately. So from the transaction, so E is that from the system perspective, if, is, there a is there a delay? The D is from the transaction perspective, is there a delay? So what did we find? I mean, this is rounded to the nearest, nearest, nearest digit. So we have um, essentially with version two of the algorithm, which kind of waits, we essentially, for if we keep the source and the destination open in this algorithm, we essentially get no delay on kind of the uh, uh, kind of uh, level of transactions. So we got uh, here we got 45,000 transactions executed between 100 banks. Oh, whoops, sorry, over an hour's period, um, and we had liquidity this liquidity level of point point one. Okay, if as soon as we keep the destination secret. We get um, we get some uh, delay. So, for example, here we get um, an average delay of uh, what is this? A five seconds. I think this is uh, this is not minutes. It's seconds. So there's a delay here of eighty five, which we would have ha wouldn't have had if we'd kept the destination secret uh, open. And then if everything's kept secret, we get a ridiculous delay. So what's the conclusion here? So the key point, the key takeaway is, is that if you were executing this algorithm, if if you wanted to execute a liquidity matching mechanism between a number of banks using a multi-party computation mechanism, which kept the amount secret and the balances of the bank secret, it is plausible to do this. It is plausible to do this now in the real world if you were prepared to leak for every transaction the source and the destination only, but no other information, OK? However, as soon as you want that information not to leak, it becomes in increasingly impossible to maintain um, a high throughput um, over, over kind of real world, real world simulated real world data, data times. OK, so that's the kind of uh, oh, oops, hold on a minute. That's the kind of kind of kind of summary, um, and this is what we went back to um, the um, ECB with, is that we can use MPC to simulate a multi-party system that would emulate the RTGS system, um, and allow and allow you to do multilateral vetting without actually having a central authority seeing what's going on. Uh, the performance is in some sense penalized due to the nature of MPC protocols. The fact that you're computing something on something that is in, in some sense encrypted, you can't see what you're computing on, means that performance decreases. And why is this? This is because you can't do things like conditional branching. Um, we can't leak memory access patterns, um, which gives to a, red, uh, a, red, a reduction in performance. And However, in the case of where you just keep the source and the destination open, but you keep the amounts and the balances secret, it is still viable with with current computing technology and current um, secure algorithms. Um, and this is just yet one more in a number of potential use cases of MPC within the financial sector. I mean, I could have talked about, as I said, 
We've been doing work on dark markets for, for stock trading. There's been a lot of work on mon anti-money laundering um, and fraud detection algorithms um, across the planet. Um, and there's a number of uh, companies working in this space with a number of uh, of banks across Europe. I could name you just a few, like um, Infer out of Switzerland, there's uh, Partizia out of Denmark, there's Cosmian out of France, and so on, uh, looking at applications within this space of secure computing technologies. And this is just one application that um, the ECB uh, wanted us to look at, and our friends from the Bank of England have been helping us understand their algorithm and their, and their simulation. But apart from that, thank you very much. And I just wanted, we just wanted to do this to kind of let you kind of know, this audience know that there are technologies out there which allow you to compute on data without seeing it. And so this is just one application of that. So it was a whistle stop tour, but it uh, allowed us to have some time to answer some questions. So far away with your questions. Matty, do you want to ask yeah, a question? Yeah, I, I should maybe take the floor. So, so uh, one one technical simple question. I mean, I, I assume uh, it's right uh, that uh, you don't need to disclose information to the three operators of the multiparty computation. No, no. So the whole point is is that the three operators only learn what we deem is 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 valid. So in the Sodo example, they see the transactions, but they only see in the clear. The source and the destination. Yeah. Okay. And this and this allows them to do so. For example, this allows them to be able to look up. Okay. This this is the location in memory of this bank. Okay. Whereas if you keep the source secret, you can't look up the location of that bank, and so therefore you have to have levels of indirection to be able to keep that secret, which is why it's it's secure. But the three parties executing the multi-party computation learn nothing about the bank's balances and learn nothing about the transaction amounts. Okay. Yeah, I had one other, uh, maybe a bit longer question. That's uh, fine. The uh, because. Um, Maybe you already indirectly answered by giving these many numerous examples of other applications. But uh, listening to your presentation, I was wondering that um, is the multi-party computation somehow, let's say, agnostic on the on the logic which is being implemented uh, on the on the level? I ask this because uh, because the the algorithm that you chose uh, this Soramaki Soramaki yeah. and Beck logic in my understanding it could be distributed as such somehow in a sense that uh, it doesn't necessarily require a centralized queue the queues could be kept at the the banks themselves and the balances could be kept at the banks themselves the bank could be just saying that okay i take my ordered queue and this is how much i would be sending it, it to doesn't you. depend it doesn't depend on the logic of the underlying algorithm but yeah. it depends on. Um, well, sorry, let's rephrase that. It, so, so basically, basically, I'm asking that: uh, Does your uh, solution is it uh, independent on the fact that in this case the algorithm happens to be kind of a distributable anyway? Yeah. No. So the point was was to investigate whether you could run the algorithm itself under MPC. Um, so the uh, so the the. Uh, the in theory, in practice, start again. In theory, you can run any algorithm. The question is, is there a significant slowdown? Okay. Um, and the and and then how that would scale. And then one of the issues here is is that it might be the case that not all, especially if you then scale this to other applications of DLTs, where there's been a lot of interest in liquidity matching, is that not all entities. Probably banks are going to be online all the time. That's their very nature. But not all entities in a in a DLT will be actually online all the time. So you can't rely on them to be there. So actually, outsourcing this to a a, a, a semi trusted group of parties is is a way of ensuring that not everybody has to be online at, at the same time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, we are running out of time. Sorry, Mati, if you have still a question, maybe you can uh, yes, bilaterally or, kind of cool. or maybe even in the chat if you want to continue. I think that's just perfectly fine. Or, or So uh, so next, we will 
give the floor to my colleague uh, Tatu Laine. Uh, he will be presenting our paper on uh, measuring counterpart risk in FMIs. So Tatu, I start sharing sharing from here. Okay. Uh, good afternoon also from my side and, and uh, hello to, I would say, old and new friends. Unfortunately, we cannot meet, meet in the auditorium in, in at the Bank of Finland. Uh, I, yes, so uh, this presentation is, is uh, done by simulator team and, uh, and uh, in this uh, in this presentation, we utilized uh, uh, the new POF PSS3 simulator. It, it was just, uh, how to say, a year ago released as a beta version, and, and now we, we have a more stabilized version and already distributed to six central banks. And also at Bank of Finland, we have done two analyses with the, the new simulator. And what are the new features there? Uh, there are the stress tester model, what, what I have used in, in my analysis. And then, then if you someday will download it, you will see the totally new interface, what we have, have in the simulator. It's on, on the web page uh, uh, interface nowadays. OK, but uh, in, in this uh, work, uh, we were starting like counter party liquidity risk analysis in the large value payment system and, and uh, our aim was really to put uh, this uh, analysis to, to really participant level. Unfortunately, in this presentation, I, I cannot show any, any detailed names. I, 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 I had to anonymize the, the results, but, uh, but in practice, if you do similar kind of analysis, you, you get a lot of uh, interesting information about the participants themselves. In this work, we also introduced new, two new liquidity risk indicators. I will come to those later on. And uh, then what was like the beef of this presentation that, that we were comparing these, uh, these risk indicators to, to high quality liquid, liquid assets, uh, what's, what's maybe not so common uh, because you are like combining two data sources. Okay, then I, I go to this met methodology. Uh, so we had a target two Suomen Pankki component, uh, uh, and uh, and it's already we downloaded it last year. It was this April uh, 2020 uh, data what we had, and uh, because it was one month uh, uh, data, there was uh, uh, in this case 16 business days. And uh, in, in this Finnish component, we have like 19 participants. What, what we can we can run this scenario for all, all of them automatically. And uh, in, in this work, we uh, took that kind of uh, scenario, scenario that the participant becomes a liquid liquidity sink. What means that uh, it cannot send payments, but still receiving payments. So you are li like cutting the other, other side of the payments. And this, this kind of scenario could happen due to technical disruption, for example. And uh, in, in this case, we, we were assuming that the disruption is, is whole day. It could be also like few minutes or few few hours. And uh, But that kind of technical detail, what you can adjust when you do your own, own simulations. And then, then we were using this stress tester tool in, in our new simulator. So we have all, uh, name it like PSS3 because the, how to say the, uh, it's upgraded so much compared to PSS2, what, what was the old, old version. Uh, then about these two indicators, uh, uh, the first one we are calling like maximum liquidity deterioration indicator and uh, it, it calculated using this end of day balances uh, in the benchmark and in the scenario like the delta what happens between these two two states and uh, then there is an uh, 
this kind of other uh, assumption that uh, in the worst case, the other participants are unable to bring extra liquidity. This, this is meaning now the, how to say, the systemic uh, component, systemic liquidity in the system. So this is the, the, the worst, worst case uh, scenario and, and the minimum deterioration is, is then if, if the participants uh, can bring uh, can bring extra able to bring extra liquidity. Uh, I will soon show the results related to these indicators. Okay, then, then I jump to results them, themselves. Uh, first of all, uh, we were calculating the upper bound for for our system and for our participants. Uh, here, here in this x-axis we have the participant index and, and then the upper bound means that uh, in practice uh, all, all the payments of a certain participant are, uh, are uh, processed like uh, uh, in real time there is no, no queue. And then, then on the other hand we, we had how to say the total liquidity capacity in the system what's like the beginning of day balance plus the intraday credit limit and uh, and here we have calculated the ratio of these two indicators like upper bound divided by total liquidity and and from here you can see that uh, that uh, in the average it's maybe 40 40 percent there are some some participants where this uh, goes up to 80 percent but for 40 percent is the typical value and uh, if you if you think what is the variation in the bar it's it's coming from the 16 business days so that's the why the bar bars are different sizes then we uh, go to next slide what's like the severity of studied scenarios and uh, and uh, like if you quickly uh, calculate there is altogether 16 uh, 16 business days times 19 scenarios so it's uh, over three 300 uh, different scenarios and uh, in each each scenario all outgoing payments are removed for a certain participant for a certain business day and uh, and for example in in this graph uh, uh, we we see one we we get one point for example that uh, all all the uh, outgoing payments of bank A bank A for example it's it's uh, altogether 10 billions and uh, and then we get one 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 point in this uh, uh, histo histogram and uh, and the uh, this y axis is, is telling the frequency. Okay, then this is uh, such a what you can also call like a direct effect. I mean, if, if the participant outgoing payments of the participant are, are, are missing. And then then uh, this slide is, is describing the, the how to say the second second round effect. When, when like uh, A cannot send payments to B, and then then uh, it causes the situation that B cannot send the payments to C due to that it it, it uh, didn't receive uh, uh, payments from A, and that uh, it's kind of a systemic effect uh, subsequent unsettled transactions. And in, in this analysis, because the system was so so liquid altogether, uh, in 99% of cases th there is no no impact. And uh, and in this graph we are showing the impact for for this remaining one one percent. And uh, it's kind of tail tail effect, but uh, in in some cases uh, again this frequency uh, can be. Uh, if you look at this x-axis, the, the uh, amount of uh, how to say missing liqu liquidity can be nine, nine to ten billion euros. 
Okay, then then let's go to next one. Here we have this uh, what we called uh, this uh, this kind of risk liquidity indicator, maximum deterioration uh, indicator, and uh, and as I explained to you, this was due to this. Uh, uh, differences between the end of day balances between the benchmark and, and the, the stress scenario. And here, here the situation is in a way that uh, uh, like uh, uh, in the case 75% effect is, is zero, then uh, in, in the case 24% uh, the effect is less than uh, 500 million, and uh, here, here, here we have again drawn the, the re remaining one one percent, and uh, it's causing a, a similar size of effect like in the previous slides. That in some cases uh, this liquidity impact is is uh, in the worst cases eight to nine or even 10, 10 million euros. Okay, then, then uh, in this uh, uh, next slide, uh, because uh, we were analyzing this this uh, whole case as, as this kind of matrix uh, form that uh, that uh, there is the scenarios what are causing liqu liquidity pressure, but also on, on the other axis there are the participants what are le like taking taking the biggest hit. From the scenarios, and and uh, this is uh, like the other other side of the coin. Yeah, the participants are taking the biggest hits and 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 causing contagion. And in in this x axis, we have the participant index, and uh, and you can see that uh, this maximum liquidity deterioration it's uh, uh, gets a quite high high value for uh, participants like seven, ten. Uh, 13 and, and and then 17. It's uh, it's around 1 billion euro, and uh, and then then the other other parameters, the systemic uh, unsettled uh, payments value, what what drawn with the uh, this orange color, uh, it, it's it's high for uh, participant 14, and this is uh, like uh, like I summarized. Uh, Participants taking the big, big, biggest hit and, and maybe causing the, the worst contagion to to, uh, to to other ones. Okay, then uh, we go to this matrix presentation. What's like my my favorite uh, that uh, that we have uh, in this uh, y-axis? We have the scenario. What uh, goes from one to eighteen in this case, and and then we have the party. Uh, participant index on on the x axis, and uh, and here we have uh, uh, what is this percentage value? It's the this risk liquidity indicator relative to liquidity capacity. We, we could in in the real well we could give the real number, but here we had to because of, of this confidentiality reason to to give only percentages. And, and from this matrix, if you are using this uh, this color colors, you can see that, for example, this scenario eight is causing the biggest threat for uh, participant twelve. Also, also if you look at the uh, scenario sixteen, it's causing trouble for uh, participants one, two, and three. So the, the, the scenario sixteen is the, maybe the Biggest threat for for the rest of the uh, participants, and and then then you can also look at the, this first column, where where like the how to say the participant uh, one in in this first uh, column is is taking the uh, biggest hit, or or if the if there is this scenario 14, 16 or 17 uh, uh, going on, so. It's it's the how to say you could say most vulnerable uh, participant for for uh, different scenarios, but uh, overall uh, this presentation is a nice way to illustrate these dependencies between the scenarios and and, and the participants. 
then we are moving to this final final part. So we, we had this kind of opportunity to get uh, this high quality liquidity assets values from from our colleagues in uh, Finnish uh, FSA supervisor supervisory authority and and this this gets this kind of uh, 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 backbone for for this analysis that uh, that you are not only to only comparing these risk liquidity values in your payment systems and 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 the capacity in the payment system now now you can also compare them to to this kind of uh, free liquid assets what what the participants have uh, otherwise and uh, and this was kind of new uh, new step in this analysis that that, that uh, so far main focus has been the settlement performance analysis but but here we could compare these 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 results to to uh, high quality li liquid assets of course there is such a limitation that now we are only only studying this target two system and if if the participant would be present in in other payment system then then of course this uh, high quality liquid asset should be divided uh, that you could, couldn't use it only only for target two system and uh, here is then the, the figure what what we got so we have this liquidity risk indicator what's this maximum deterioration indicator and and now it's relative to high quality liquid assets and uh, in the uh, most of the cases like uh, uh, if it's zero, uh, uh, it's, it's like in, in 90, almost 94 percent of cases. And here, here I have taken again this, this tail. Uh, there is like 6.35 percent presented in this figure, and 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 you you can see that uh, this this risky liquid assets are maybe 10 percent. Uh, uh, 10 to 20 percent, but but in some cases can can even be 50, 60 percent, and it, this this might be kind of alarming uh, signal. I mean, of course, the real analysis we could show who who is the this this participant, but uh, now now it's only only this kind of relative number. Okay, then then I go to go to my summary. So. In this work, the idea uh, was to use this uh, target Cox Suomen Pankki data and, and our, our new simulator. There is this uh, stress tester tool, and uh, and we we were like uh, introducing these two liquidity indicators. What I explained, and uh, and uh, then then the how to say three key results are that the liquidity deterioration occur more often than settlement failures and if we are com com comparing to high quality assets it's maybe six percent what's what's in in danger and and in some cases even 60 60 percent so this this was the uh, how to say the outcome and and, and our, our result from from this work so now now if there is any any questions i i can i can answer answer them thank you i think we will give the floor to to our colleagues um let me take the control of the presentation uh from the european central bank and bundesbank so uh sarah testi and um and Alexander Müller will be presenting on uh, the target to analytical tools for regulatory compliance. So is it you are going to start, Sarah? Or yeah. So uh, you are muted. Uh, you can. I will unmute you. If it, does it work now? Okay. Yes, okay. we can hear so, you. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you took the control. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Sara Testi. I work at the uh, European Central Bank. 
some of you already know me, other for the others, nice to meet you. So it's always a pleasure to present at this seminar. It's of course much nicer to do it from Helsinki, but still it's nice to be here. Um, today I have the pleasure to uh, present uh, the target to uh, analytical tools for regulatory compliance. This is a collection of tools developed by the TAG, that is the Target Analytics Group. So it is a collective work. Um, I am sharing this presentation with uh, my colleague Alexander Mueller from the Bundesbank, who is also part of the same group. Uh, I'm not sure that he is connected or he has his camera on already. OK, hi, Alexander. So if you would like to introduce yourself and say hi, I will then stop my video because, as you saw, I'm using a different screen than the one where I have the camera, so that's a bit confusing for me then to present. No, thank you, Sarah. Um, I hope you can hear me. So, hello, everybody. As Sarah mentioned, yeah, it's always a pleasure to be in Helsinki and now this year at least to present at, at the seminar. So I'm glad to, to be back once again. And um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm part of this uh, target analytics group for, for quite some, some years. And uh, it's always a nice uh, example of European cooperation, I must say. So I'm happy to have this joint presentation to, uh, today. And uh, I give back the floor to Sarah, please. So thank you, Alexander. So I hope I managed to, OK. So uh, as I mentioned, this work is a collective work from the group, and in particular here you have the names of the colleagues from the other central banks uh, that took part of it and the usual disclaimer in relation to the usage of the uh, target to data. Uh, so in, 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 in this presentation, we will first give you a bit of background, so how, why we do that, why, why we, we develop these, these, these methodologies and approaches. And then we will offer an example of, this, uh, of the um, individual approaches under the uh, different principles or under the different PFMI principles. And then we will uh, conclude. So, so as you know, uh, Target 2 is the real-time gross settlement system for the euro uh, that processes uh, so euro-denominated payments in central bank money. And Target 2 is a systemically important payment system. As such, it's subject to a regulation that is called the SIPs regulation, the regulation for uh, on oversight requirements for systemically important payment systems by the ECB that transposes the CPMI IOSCO principles for the PFMIs. I mean, as, as, as you know, uh, those principles provide a, a framework to define and assess the, the, the robustness, the resiliency of a financial market infrastructure in terms of risk and, and efficiency. So within this framework, the target to operator is requested to periodically assess the resilience of target to the different type of risks. Other uh, payment systems worldwide are subject to the similar provision. So we thought that this uh, topic of, of, of tools for regulatory compliance could be a shared interest to a wider range of, of operators and, and also to, to, to overseers. That's why we are, we are uh, introducing it to you uh, today. Um, but why we speak about uh, analytical tools? So some of these regulatory requirements need to be to be supported for their fulfillment by an analysis at quite granular uh, level. So this is the case, for example, of the uh, um, compliance to the principles that you've seen in the overview, uh, the one on interdependency, the principle on liquidity risk, on identification of critical participants, or the one of tiering. So thanks to the access to transaction level data and the analysis that we can do uh, of this transaction level data, the target to operator through the target analytics group was uh, able to fulfill these specific regulatory requirements. Um, so the group has uh, elaborated a number of different um, approaches, analytical approaches that range from uh, let's say simpler statistical indicators to more complex methodologies, some of which also use the um, simulator developed by the Bank of Finland and adapted to, to Target 2. And today we are here to uh, present you in one single work uh, this toolkit. Uh, 
Um, during the presentation, you will also find the, um, the links to some publications that gather here and there to some pieces of, of this work. So in case you would like to go more in depth on that. I mean, in general, the focus of this presentation, it's more on the, um, on the approaches, on the methodologies than on the results. So going to the uh, first, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, group of, of, of approaches that I would like to, um, to present you, those relate to the compliance of principle T of, of the PFMIs that requires the operator to identify and manage risks related to interdependencies. Uh, in target two, we follow the uh, CPMI IOSCO report of 2008, and we identify uh, the three types of interdependencies among FMIs uh, of target two with other FMIs. So these are the system-based interdependencies, can, can be horizontal or vertical, these are direct cross-system relationships, institutional interdependencies, these are indirect relationship between uh, system um, between systems from a common participant or environmental interdependencies deriving from other factors such as service providers. All these interdependencies are investigated separately with a specific focus on the operational and the liquidity risk emerging from them. Um, as, as interdependencies evolve over time, it's important to regularly check them, so we make this type of monitoring and analysis on an annual basis. So um, here, I mean, going to the first type of interdependencies, the system-based interdependencies, here you have an example of one of the indicators that we developed. In general, I mean, for all these type of interdependencies, we analyze them with a broad set of indicators, but as an exemplification for the purpose of this presentation, we chose only one. Um, vertical interdependencies are interdependencies among systems along the clearance and settlement chain. Typically, they are the interdependencies between a real-time gross settlement system and the ancillary systems that do the final settlement or the funding in this system. In target two, this is the case of target two, the interdependencies between the target two and the participated ancillary systems. Here you have an example of an identification of, uh, um, of these interdependencies. Um, it's, the, uh, average, it's a chart on the average daily value of the ancillary systems. In the target to traffic, we have, as I mentioned, other indicators, more breakdowns. I mean, in general, um, in, with this type of interdependencies, we mostly focus on the liquidity nature of the interdependencies, because, of course, the, 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 this provides a view on, on the speed or amplitude of the reach emerging from the connections across these different systems. So um, here, I mean, you saw that you see that the, there was in 2019 around 343 billion per day settled by ancillary system uh, compared to the overall target to system. And this represents uh, between 17 and 18 percent of the target to traffic. So it's quite relevant. Um, another type of, of, uh, of identification, of, uh, another type of interdependence is the horizontal one, so between two systems at the same stage of the settlement chain. For target, this is the case of the interdependency within two S and TIPS. It's mostly a liquidity interdependency, but also the interdependencies of operational nature due to the closeness of these systems. Here you see a picture of the um, um, ECB a chart on the ECB uh, transit account balance during the day. So this is, uh, is represents the liquidity held in trade in T2S, so how much liquidity leaves target to during the day to settle in T2S. Um, as you see here, this, I mean, this, this pattern follows largely the, 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 the day, the, the settlement day in T2S with uh, liquidity going uh, at the start of the night time settlement in T2S, around 70 billion. Then it grows uh, until reaching the highest point around three in the afternoon. And then it, it goes to zero towards the end of the T2S day at 1745. Um, another type of interdependencies are the uh, institution-based interdependencies. So those interdependencies arising from the same participant participating in more than one ancillary system. To measure uh, this type of interdependencies, we usually typically network-based statistics or connectivity measures. Here in this chart, uh, you see uh, the network of ancillary system and target to uh, financial institutions. 
So the reason why we use for this, this, this type of, of, of connectivity measures is because from the, the interconnections deriving from, from the same participant uh, could also be a channel for contagion effect. So what this picture shows, it's the red dots, uh, this network shows the, the red dots that are the target to participants and the dots that are a bit bigger of other colors, which are the ancillary system in which they participate. There is a filter, so it's a simplified picture because there is a filter of minimum traffic settled, otherwise it would be extremely crowded, this, uh, this, uh, um, this picture. Um, overall, the, the connectivity of the network in target 2 is extremely low. From this, we can derive that the risk of contagion through institution-based interdependencies is rather low in target 2, so each participant is connected to, in average, to 2.8 unique ancillary systems in, in target. Um, here, uh, it's, we have a, a picture of the um, environmental-based uh, uh, we have an analysis, a recap of the main points uh, deriving from the identification of environmental-based interdependencies. This is mostly a descriptive section because it focuses on interdependencies when network provider and critical service provider. So I would skip it in the interest of time, but the main outcomes are there. And then I would like to quickly go through the uh, analysis that we do uh, of liquidity risk. Uh, so here, I mean, the operator is uh, required by the principle seven to uh, have uh, tools to identify, measure and monitoring settlement and funding flows, uh, also including the use of intraday liquidity. Here also the operator is required to conduct stress testing. And for that, we have uh, developed a number of liquidity indicator and ad hoc studies. Um, so here with this first picture, I mean, you can see uh, on the left side, um, the uh, yellow line, no, the blue line represents the sum of the start of the balance on participants RTGS of, uh, uh, account. So it's the overall liquidity that is uh, available in target two at the start of the day, whereas the um, uh, yellow line represents the um, overall intraday credit line set by the participants as a sum of the first intraday credit line set. Uh, if you look, I mean, quickly at the picture of the liquidity, you can see that there was a, an extreme increase uh, over time. I mean, from 2008 until today, it's uh, more than 10 times more liquidity you have, I mean, as a result of the monetary policy measures. And we reached uh, 3 uh, trillion at, uh, in, in, yeah, I think it was in October and December, so a bit high, 3.2 trillion in December 2020. Um, the other picture shows the um, uh, intraday credit usage uh, at the change of each hour uh, by target to participants. This shows the overall usage. I mean, in general, this is it's quite um, it's quite important for us to show this type of picture because we, as a target to operator, have a database where we are able to monitor. Um, liquidity and intraday credit levels at an hour, hourly frequency for all participants. So we can see also what happens in the intraday increase. For example, there are some peaks that create or in relation to specific events. Uh, here, this is another, this is a, a study that we did some time ago, so it's not too recent, but it really serves the purpose of exemplifying um, which type of analysis we do with the distribution of payments. Um, during the day, which is important to be monitored um, as it can reflect operational and liquidity risk for the RTGS or for its participants. In case, for example, there's a particular concentration at a certain time of the day. I mean, this, this picture in particular shows an analysis that we did across different levels of liquidity. So before the APP uh, in February 2015, after the APP uh, from February uh, 2000, from, from March 2015 until 2017, and then just for 2018. Basically, what, what it shows is that this, this, the usage of liquidity has been relatively stable throughout the different uh, liquidity levels. And uh, I mean, there's no particular concentration around 50%, 15% of the, um, of the, the traffic is settled already in the first hour, and then there's a constant pace that increases until the end of the day. Uh, the last 
picture that I would like, the last chart that I would like to show you are a couple of, of uh, liquidity usage indicators. Mm, the one on the left side, it's the uh, liquidity comparison of liquidity velocity and the liquidity used in the system. Um, you can see that the so liquidity velocity is the value of payments made for each unit of liquidity that the uh, yellow line which decreases as liquidity increased in the system and the liquidity used is the um, account balance and intraday credit line used for to settle payments and these instead increase of course with increase of liquidity. Uh, the other chart shows the um, an analysis of the funding sources. Uh, so, um, as you know, I mean, to fund payments, participants in a payment system have the incoming payments, the account balance, or the intraday credit line. I mean, in target, the main funding sources, the account balance, and this increase with the increase of liquidity in the system. Uh, incoming payments account for around 19% and decreased with increase of liquidity and 8% uh, more or less intraday credit and this remained quite stable. With that, I would give the floor to Alexander that will conclude on this section and uh, okay, and, uh, and and go on in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I hope you can again hear me. Um, so I've taken control successfully. It would be nice to have such a button in, in much more different circumstances. Uh, now I'm losing control because I skipped the slide I wanted to present. Here we go. Um, in a, addition to those indicators on liquidity risk that Sarah has presented in the Eurosystem, we have also done uh, quite some ad hoc studies, some larger studies that were done just, just once or at, uh, with a lower frequency. Um, I'm just mentioning them here because they have all been presented in previous uh, seminars at the Bank of Finland and also um, led to two publications. The first is the stress test of uh, liquidity risk in uh, in Target 2, where we were running simulations um, with uh, yeah, collateral deteriorations, different severities and impact on the intraday credit lines. And it demonstrated that the system is resilient under stress and that we have quite enough liquidity in the system. Did another analysis on the liquidity savings mechanisms in Target 2 that has been presented uh, last year. So um, we changed system parameters in Target 2. So we removed those algorithms that are solving those gridlock solutions, we or gridlock situations we have already heard about uh, earlier today. And uh, this study shows that the presence of these uh, LSM improves the settlement efficiency despite the high liquidity levels we have. So they are still nice to have. And um, we have this profiling study where we try to find out uh, with a clustering analysis if we have similarities in between the participants that have similar uh, patterns of payment behavior. And uh, we found 10 different payment profiles, typical profiles for the behavior of the participant. And it turned out that most of the participants introduced their transactions early in the day, the early and extreme early birds. So let's turn to the next. Uh, principle, the principle 17 on operational risk. This is mainly about critical participants and operational outages. So this principle requires an FMI to identify critical participants based on the consideration of transaction volumes and values and on the potential impact on other participants and the system in the event of an operational problem. So the focus here is on um, credit institutions, but we have similar methodologies for auxiliary systems and so parties, service providers. And then as a consequence of all these exercises I'm going to present, we have then mitigation measures that are applied for those identified critical participants. So the main challenge we are facing is the selection of indicators and definition of thresholds, because you cannot uh, say ex ante that you are critical. You do not know who is critical in your system. And um, even ex post, you cannot say, OK, this one has been critical, because in this principle, you find those, those uh, yeah, these definitions that need to be transferred into practice. Uh, if you say, what is a potential impact? Uh, what is the significant operational problem? So you have to somehow select your indicators where you measure those potential impact and then also define thresholds where you translate and your indicator to a yeah one off decision you are critical or you're not. So the Eurosystem has Two criteria to identify critical participants, critical credit institution. The first is very straightforward, just using the turnover. If you settle at least 1% of the total turnover, you are critical. 
The criterion two is you cause at least 1.5% of unsettled payments in value terms in a simulation of an operational failure. So the, um, the simulation analysis is very, very similar to this um, that has been presented by, by Tatu earlier. Um, so I don't have to enter into these details. It's a quite comprehensive study of such an operational failure. There can, we can, in this simulation, directly measure this potential impact. And then again, you have a threshold if you're above your critical. And it's enough if one of these criteria are met and we have an additional element of time dependency. We have some additional analysis for network effects, hidden risks. Again, this goes in the same directions as presented by Tatu and in addition, we have presented it in more detail already in the 2017 simulator seminar. After you have identified critical participants, again, you keep in mind the, the, the thing is what happens in the case of an operational outage. Um, still, you do not know if they're really critical, but what you can measure is are there operational outages? Do your critical participants have operational outages? And then you might learn from these operational outages also what really happens in the system. Um, in contrast to simulations, there you have then some kind of a real experiment. Therefore, we have this kind of algorithm in the basic approach where I try to identify low payment activity. Basically, the first percentile in a, in a time bucket is def defined as low. That you have to adjust a bit for general and individual payment behavior of the participants. And we then link consecutive intervals. And if you have like four in a row, then the probability that you had an outage is, is quite high. And then we consider this as a potential outage. So we have a, a data set of potential outages where at least we can analyze ex post if there have been outages and what has happened in this case. Um, the example I think is is uh, is quite telling because you, you really see it these blue bars they are the, the outage um, the normal activity is the green line and then you see this participant he, it, on that day it showed the red line so nothing during this potential outage and then this spike where he somehow kept catched up with the with the payments that have not been settled in this in this period and that's it already on the um, on the operational risks and uh, critical participants and outages. And we turn to the last principle, the tier participation arrangements. And again, we have a principle of the PFMIs that requires us to identify, monitor, and manage the material risks to the FMI arising from the tier participation. This means indirect participations, so banks settling transactions, but that are not a direct member of the of the infrastructure. And in target two, uh, direct participants can offer services to settle transactions on behalf of other institutions. This can be indirect participants, so-called addressable BICs, but also other institutions not registered in the target directory. So basically any, any bank in the world that has a BIC uh, can send, uh, if it has a connection to a direct participant, can send uh, payments in, in target two. So there is a potential of tiering and we have to, to look at it. Our methodology mainly focuses on tiering on the sending side. So the originator of the payment is different from the sender as we consider it more relevant for operational risk. But at the same time, we have also statistics of tiering on the receiving side where the beneficiary is different from the receiver and produce them as well. And we exclude intra-group tiering where somehow the, the originator and the sender are different but still uh, um, belong to the same banking group. And once again, we have the problem to translate this assessment into some material uh, thresholds or indicators because there is also nothing that says if you have a tiering level of X percent, you have a risk, and if it's below, you don't. So even in the literature recently, uh, there were uh, um, results that even indicate that tiering is not per se something bad. Yeah, that also you have can have advantages if you have tiering in your system. So. The exercise here is really that we look at the tiering levels. And as you can see here, they turn out to be stable. We do not see any material risks that arise from them. And this is why the Euro system considers the tiering levels in target two as, um, yeah, as managed, let's say. And still we repeat, of course, this exercise and try to, to, to deepen our analysis uh, continuously to uh, confirm that is still the case. In value terms, the tiering levels are very similar on both sides, sending and receiving side, around 6% of the transactions. In volume, the level of tier participation differs. 
because the sending side is much higher than the receiving side somehow shows that um, that on the sender side you have let's say more banks sending small value payments so a higher higher numbers of payments but in in value terms it's more or less the same this is mainly caused by the different composition uh, of the of the payments um, because as you can see here um, the interbank transactions account for the largest share of tiering in value terms and uh, on the volume side it's mainly customer transactions small value customer transactions that that uh, drive uh, the the tiering levels so on the receiving side what we can observe is that somehow um, on, on, the, on the sending side you have more banks from let's say outside that are not direct participants of target to sending those those customer payments compared to those receiving them we also look at the the country split so um, the countries whose institutions are tiered main contributors are united states china and the european economic area so somehow say the economically big countries and those close to europe so no uh, or close to the eurozone um, so no no surprises here let's basically and on the offer side uh, we look also at the countries where the institutions offer tiering service main contributors are germany and france here but of course we also observe like some some typical relations that that finnish banks uh, are offering their services to let's say neighboring countries that have not adopted the euro just as an example so you can observe those those links that are in the most cases not very surprising but this gives us additional insights it allows us to understand better those tiering arrangements and uh, the behavior of our participants so we have heard a lot about many, 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 many um, different uh, PFMI uh, requirements. So um, let me let me conclude and and summarize here. So the application of this advanced analytics and granular data allowed the target two operator to develop this really comprehensive framework for supporting the compliance with regulation. So the lesson learned is here: if you have a payment system, if you're operator, you just you need your data, you need the tools to analyze your data you yeah you just need the data and uh, as i have the tradition of making comparisons with the analysis to a sauna just summarize it here like a, a payment system without the data is just like a like a cold sauna the sauna without the heat it doesn't make any fun um at the same time the analysis offered that we are doing for regulatory compliance um, it's offered important insights and understanding about the functioning of the system the liquidity circulation and the behavior in addition to this um, uh, this mere regulatory compliance and as a target analytics group we keep fine-tuning and improving our toolkit and uh, we will have soon the challenge of the target to t2s consolidation um, to revise our our methodologies and let me mention at this point that it, it it's really important that it's not just for regulatory compliance of course this is what you have to do as a payment system or as an fmi operator but um, you can learn so much more. And I think, uh, again, this seminar and uh, the seminars in the previous years have, have shown how much uh, interesting topics you have in, in payment system analysis you have had and you will still have in, in the future. And somehow just, just doing regulatory compliance is, is a bit like, uh, like, like the virtual simulator seminar. So it's, it's good, it's important, and you, you do great things. But uh, there's something missing, and in that respect, let me thanks to you all uh, for your for your interesting presentations in this seminar. And again, it's very enriching. It's very nice to the Bank of Finland to to organize this. And uh, indeed, uh, as has been said several times, we all hope to be able uh, to meet to really meet and to have a real seminar next year. And in particular, if you learn that it's the 20th seminar already then i think we should celebrate this not necessarily 20 rounds of sauna but maybe with two or a few more so thanks to you all and thanks for your attention and we are ready for your questions thank you alexander um, now we have an uh, opportunity to get some questions from the audience yeah, i could comment maybe that um, from my experience also this has been interesting to to follow up the the progression of uh, 
the methodologies uh, around this uh, this field. But uh, I have to raise one point that the simulator came before the regulation. <laughs> Next, we will uh, hear a presentation from uh, Canada. Yeah. And uh, there is one, one comment uh, from Matikame. In addition to data, you also need skilled operators to utilize the data. Thanks for the presentation. But OK, let's move to, to Canada, Canadian contribution. And um, I have heard that uh, you have a lot of things going on uh, in your production systems in, in Canada. So hopefully everything is going well. and. Yes, so please uh, have the floor. OK, thank you. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, thank you. So this is John's work. Uh, and uh, I present as uh, a first part Then my uh, co-author, Zhen Dong, will present the second part. So the topic we go to present is about uh, quantifying the economic benefits of uh, payment modernization the case of large value uh, payment system. Okay. So in Canada, uh, we have the major payment system. So we have two major pay payment system. One is a large uh, value transfer uh, uh, system that is LVTS. That's for large value at the time of critical the payment. And another one that is a retail payment system. That's the process for relatively small value payments. So now in Canada, we are doing a payment modernization uh, program. So, yeah, can you, yes, change your slides? Yeah. So in this uh, modernization uh, program, um, so in the new, uh, in the modernized uh, systems, uh, we have, um, generally speaking, we have a uh, three payment system, and uh, that is the uh, links, that is the uh, large value transfer systems, and uh, SOE and RTR. But uh, today we focus on the large value transfer systems, that is the link, that is a real time growth settlement system uh, for large payment system. It's going to replace the LVTS currently we used. Okay. Please change your slides, Zhentong. Yeah. Um, to understand the economic impact of the payment modernization, it is critical to answer uh, such a research question. So what's the economic benefit from this uh, replacement, replacement uh, you know, replace uh, link uh, LVTS with uh, links. What economic benefit from this change? Okay, that is a major uh, topic today. We talk about the economic benefit from this uh, uh, modernization on the large value transfer system. In this literature, very limited work has been done for quantifying the economic benefit because it is a challenge in using economic model to quantify the benefit. So, uh, yes, Jindu. Um, uh, one paper that's uh, by uh, Ariani, he used the discounted cash flow analysis method uh, exam to exam uh, the benefit of uh, uh, adopting ISO 222 in the following aspect. So, so he actually he examined what economic benefit can bring to a Canadian um, uh, payment system if uh, we take the new uh, uh, standard message, uh, uh, international message uh, method that's is ISO 222, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we also need to investigate another part uh, in the modernizations. How about you know, what the economic benefit uh, this modernization can bring to a, a participant, can bring to a, a 
connected on uh, uh, economics. So, for example, uh, the uh, risk control model changed. Um, this can stop. That's what we want, want to focus. And uh, Zhentong, change your slides. So what's the contribution to this paper? In this paper, we propose empirical firm, framework for quantifying the economic benefit uh, arising from the replacement of LVTS with links. This, this framework depends on the estimation of a random payoff function that uh, highlight two important uh, aspect one is a uh, liquidity cost another one is um, risk okay then the discrete choice approach um, uh, following uh, the barry and his courses method this kind of method is used to uh, estimate the uh, random payoff uh, 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 function and uh, so then second step, based on the estimated uh, uh, payoff function, we use a um, simulation method to calculate uh, the welfare change uh, by replacing the LVTS with uh, links. So next step, uh, my co-author, uh, Zhen Tong, uh, go to present it. OK, Zhen Tong, please. OK. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, the I will continue to talk about the, uh, the the model. We basically specify a random utility model, which is a standard uh, approach in empirical I/O in economics, if you know. Uh, uh, but, and then we, which uh, we, which basically model the preference of, of participants uh, in the in the payment system, uh, and uh, the pay random payout function or utility function depends on the key characteristics of the system uh, and also some characteristics of the payment itself. I will, yeah, I will talk about details later. Uh, and then we estimate this model with um, LVTS data, which now become historical because uh, the new system links actually was online two days ago. Uh, and uh, we then evaluate uh, the random, calculate the welfare change uh, after we replace LVTS with the links. So we, then we compare the welfare. So that's the basic uh, sort of logic. Um, and the data we are using um, or uh, LVTS transaction data in 2019, uh, we have some observables of each transaction. Um, uh, for example, the value and the timing of the payment, sending and receiving FIs and the also, there's a very important part is the uh, system choice because actually LVTS is not just one system, actually two systems. Uh, and so, so this is the most important variation we are trying to exploit, how they trade off uh, choosing between T1 and T2, we call T1 and T2, and uh, uh, based on their uh, the consideration of risk and uh, uh, and uh, liquidity costs. Uh, so we also, of course, observe each uh, FI's intraday liquidity positions, um, bilateral and multilateral credit limits, and also the payment income outcome, uh, income and the de demand. Um, so all this information characterizing uh, uh, someone's taking control of the presentation. <laughs> Should I take it back? Uh, okay, do that. Uh, okay. Um, and also we, we supplement the data with uh, ACS as data to construct the sort of outside option, um, which um, is provide the benchmark for for uh, for measuring the, 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 those utilities. Um, okay. The sample construction, the basic logic for constructing the, the, the data set for this uh, exercise, uh, you can think of, how, uh, of you can think about it as a, a regression if you like, uh, but it's actually more compli more complicated than that because it's a nonlinear model. But um, 
But if you think about it from a regression point of view, there's an outcome variable, which is actually the choice of the system, T1 and the T2 and the outside option. T1 and T2 have distinct characteristics. Uh, T1 is generally thought of as more uh, liquidity cost, uh, more costly, but has um, is safer. Uh, and uh, but T2 is has more risks of the delay, but it has a lower uh, liquidity cost requirement. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, other explanatory variables uh, like characteristics of payment systems and also the payment itself. So uh, we're basically using those variables to explain why they choose one of the other. Uh, so it's uh, if this the simplest one you can think of is a binary choice, but the, here we have three choices. Um, so uh, then we're basically trying to estimate the, the their preference over some uh, the characteristics of T1 and T2. Um, so uh, the how do we measure the outcome variables? These they are based on the um, uh, the choice probabilities. Um, like the, the which is basically the market share of T1 and T2 on the outside option, we have to we also uh, divide the market, divide all the observations of payments into categories, uh, so that we group similar payments into sim into one into a group, uh, so um, we can apply this uh, methodology. So basically, we define one uh, given sender, receiver, and the given hour of a day and the value percentile. Uh, that's for a given market. Then we look at the market share within this market, relative market share of T1, T2, and outside option. So, and this will also give us a control of a different, a lot of uh, characteristics or some with that we want to control, like the sender's receiver, the other dummy, basically the dummies. So a lot of unobservables are controlled by this. Um, and the outside share is cal calibrated from uh, ACSS data, which is the retail system, as Fuchun already mentioned. Um, so, and the the basic then the the idea is that to look at how uh, the how the participants, the sender is uh, in this particular case, choose between T1 T2 for given payment, uh, and uh, for given payment, they consider whether choose T1 T2 and evaluate, look at the trade off. Um, and then we look at the outcome, their eventual T1, T2 choice. So which basically review, this is basically a, a simple idea of review the preference from their choice of T1, T2 review their preference on the uh, characteristics of payment system. Okay. Uh, okay, some uh, very quickly, some summary stats of T1, T2 in LVTS data. Uh, if you look at the uh, this is uh, x axis is the uh, value percentile from low to high in the high value bin. You can see uh, that uh, the, the share of T1 becomes higher, uh, but in the low range, um, low value range, mostly it's T2 having most of the market share. So, this is a very interesting variation in the data we are trying to exploit. Um, uh, so and also there are some other variation like for different hours in the day, they, they use T1, T2 differently, which which reveals their preference because uh, their trade off between liquidity costs and, uh, uh, and the risk during the day. Um, so which uh, these are all important variation we our model will, will try to capture. Okay, let me skip this one. Um, so the so the, the difficulty part of this uh, exercise is how to construct characteristics of the payment system, which is the key identification. There's identification problem if you think about the regression because there are very limited variation in the system characteristics. The system doesn't change much, right? For many years, it's stayed the same. So and one country usually only have one or two system. In this case, it's two systems. So the, the 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 thing is that it doesn't have any variation. So the uh, and then uh, it's hard to identify. Uh, you know, participants' preference on those characteristics, and one way to do the one way to proceed is maybe taking this approach. Uh, they pull data from different countries and uh, uh, look at the variation, cross-country variation. But what we are doing here is we try to exploit 
we take a different approach. We explore intraday variation uh, in the uh, transaction data, even though the, the, the system characteristic doesn't change, but when interacting with the payment characteristics, so it did which gen it will generate the variations. Uh, so for each payment, it's uh, liquidity position and the uh, timing and the sender and the, the receiver. All this dimension have variation uh, diff uh, differ across different payments. So when interact with this with the uh, system characteristic, it generates useful variation. Um, okay, so how do we? Uh, do the interaction, we do it through those constructing some indicators. Um, and uh, uh, for, for uh, I'm, I want to be mindful of the time, so I will skip certain details. Basically, we construct one con important uh, uh, indicator is the liquidity cost. Uh, we construct the, the cost of sending a payment for a particular payment, how much would you spend? Uh, in terms of collateral amount uh, to for to to get this payment through, so based this of course based on some uh, specific design of LVTS, it could be adjusted to other systems to, to uh, yeah if needed. Uh, and the other uh, indicator we want construct is um, because the first indicator reflecting an important factor is liquidity cost when sending payments. The other part should be like risk, right? So uh, we want to capture this two important, the, the, this important trade-off. The safety measure is based on the uh, liquidity risk indicator, uh, which which actually measures uh, the sender's, um, sender's perception of their, uh, well, their, their assessment of their own payment capacity. Um, after making this current payment, if after making this payment until the end of the day, how safe I am in terms of liquidity position. So this, this indicator is trying to reflect uh, that kind of uh, measure uh, to measure how safe I am in terms of liquidity in the system um, because I don't want to reach to my credit, li credit limit and uh, then which will delay my payments because I can no longer send. Um, I have to do something else. So, so that that's this indicator is trying to measure uh, that. Uh, so, but of course, there are some details I will skip. Um, and then there, then based on the and these two indicators will be fit into the utility function, a random utility model, the utility function of a participant of the sender. Uh, and then we try to estimate their coefficients, basically. Uh, and this coefficient will reflect how they trade off between those two indicators. Um, so do, would they trade like liquidity cost more uh, uh, and think of, uh, or they, they think safety uh, more important than liquidity cost? So th we don't know about that. We know they care. We know the direction that they they they, they like low cost. They like higher uh, safety, but we don't know exactly the trade-off. So that's what the model is doing. The model is trying to uh, use those data, use those variation in T1, T2, and then back out their preference. So that's the, the, the review the preference uh, point, uh, the, the, the review the preference logic from their actual choice. And we have this advantage of having T2 of T1, T2 variation. So that's about the model. I will skip this uh, all the details uh, of the um, of those uh, uh, some details setup. But I want to just show you that uh, if you look at um, uh, if you look at the estimation results, and you can see the liquidity cost uh, coefficient have the expected sign, and the, the safety index also has the expected sign is positive, and they are both significant. So give us and the, and of course the, uh, the the number is the magnitude is different, which will be important uh, in evaluating the the trade-off. They just basically measure the weight on those two indicators. Uh, and we will use this number to do the welfare calculation and do the counterfactual. Uh, and I want to mention that because this is sort of a standard uh, model, standard approach in empirical I/O, which is trying to usually used to evaluate the economic benefits of certain new product entry. Uh, here we use it 
as to treat links as a new product, replacing the old product. So we need to calculate LVTS uh, welfare first. Uh, and there's already some formula already given the model of specification. Uh, and um, based on the utility function we estimated, we can calculate in this way. Uh, I won't go into the details, but uh, the utility function you can see uh, are based on estimated parameters and also the, those indicators are very important. Uh, and then we move to when we to move to links, uh, then a lot of uh, several things we need to um, uh, come up with. The first, the, the two indicators we can do how we construct those in two indicators for the links because the links is a new system. Uh, we didn't know anything about links. We don't know, um, so we have to use a simulation. Uh, and which is part of is kind of aligned with the the, the main theme of this uh, conference even, uh, and we have to simulate this new link system. We we, we uh, for this project we simply uh, we only simulate a simple very simplified version and get those indicators. Uh, we fit the uh, LVTS data into this new simple uh, links indicator, and so you can get uh, all the. Uh, uh, indicators uh, in when in the links and the the, the coefficients are already estimated. We, we uh, treat them as given and uh, fixed. They won't change it because of reflecting preference. Uh, and some, of course, some other uh, other variables like this unobservable is hard to measure because unobserved characteristic of links is unknown. Uh, and uh, so we have to make some assumptions on it. And we try the different range of uh, we, we we use uh, uh, weighted. Uh, basically, we assume that it is proportional to the observables of LVTS, and then we try to vary this parameter to see um, the, the the benefit to, to evaluate the welfare change. Okay. Um, so then we look at some. Let's look at some results. The liquidity cost the change. If you look at these graphs for different banks, and the, for each bank we look at the different hours in the day, uh, and the, you can see that in almost all the uh, cases, links have a higher liquidity cost, which is expected because it's more closer to RTGS system, so it's liquidity more costly. Uh, but it's not too much. It's uh, just a little bit uh, because it also uh, because when uh, it also combines the two, two tranches in T1, T2, uh, so it gives additional some some benefits of liquidity recycling. Actually, it's not that uh, uh, not a lot higher. Uh, and uh, in terms of safety, it's better than LVTS. Um, so which I always expected. So we want to um, and then we. We want to. I want to show you some uh, results. Uh, results of the welfare change. If you look at the uh, so this uh, the y-axis, all the points are, are welfare uh, changes from uh, LVTS to links. When it's above zero, then you have a welfare benefit. It's below zero, you have welfare loss overall. Uh, and uh, you and the, which is plotted as a function of LVTS payments, the fraction of LVTS payments migrated to uh, links. So you can see that if 90% of the uh, and this heavily depends on one point I want to really emphasize is that it heavily depends on the migration ratio from the LVTS to links. If a lot of people use this new system, then welfare change with the welfare will likely to have a, to be positive. Uh, but if no one use it, of course, it's, it's like a, no one use the system. It's a, no one likes it. So it's a, definitely become negative. Uh, and we actually show that uh, only it, it, it almost it need like 90% of the payments to migrate to links. So uh, which is a pretty high requirement for a new system. Um, to 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 make the overall benefit, uh, welfare uh, uh, to be positive, um, okay. And also, uh, if the, the we plotted the, against the other sort of uh, um, uh, variable, which is the payoff improvement of links over LVTS, so which is quite a, a large improvement. Uh, so if if uh, if link uh, if the links um, um, 
want to kind of have a positive welfare change. Um, so it's almost 95% increase, but we don't know exactly how to achieve that. Uh, maybe through the reduced credit risk uh, uh, or something else like adopting of a liquidity saving mechanism uh, to improve the, the, the utility function uh, of the uh, for the participants. Um, OK, I I need to. Uh, and also I want to, uh, just one last one slide to mention that there is a quite heterogeneity among different banks. Uh, actually, bigger banks may uh, benefit a little more than for, from this uh, transition, but smaller banks uh, might uh, hurt uh, so uh, or benefit less. So there's we should be mindful of this transition that it just has certain inequality across different banks. Um, OK, so let me quickly conclude. Uh, we uh, try to quantify the benefits of payment modernization, of course, focusing on large value payment system in the future. Uh, we want to, to expand our analysis to evaluate more uh, systems, like to even touch upon the retail system, to give an overall uh, assessment of the payment modernization. OK, that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for your attention. If you have any, any questions, uh, please go, go ahead. Any questions coming? If there's no other questions, I could ask, uh, uh, this is Matti speaking, in the very last slides you had the welfare change uh, displayed as a function of the migration to Lynx. Uh, I just wonder what is this, um, what could deliver this 20% cost reduction? Is this a policy measure, say some subsidy to incentivize the, the migration or what could it be? Uh, it could be, um, yeah, it, it could be that. But we, but in our mind, we, we more think of it more like the uh, some sort of a liquidity saving mechanism, uh, so so that they can um, uh, sort of mitigate the higher liquidity costs of the RTGS system. Um, so yeah, twenty percent is of course a bit arbitrary. Um, but it's just something we we, we tried, <laughs> um, but we don't have exact you know measure how much is that. So we just tried some different numbers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some other questions in the chat, so maybe you can tackle those. Okay. <laughs> so there is. Um... Yeah, I saw the question. Uh, you can see have, them. OK, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, have you run the simulations for from earlier times when they could? Uh, no, not really. We only simulate the 2019 data. I think you're talking about the uh, maybe even earlier uh, before the uh, financial crisis, but we didn't do that. Uh, but, it's a, I, but I think it's an interesting proposal to look at if because it's um, because the in the future we may experience that at some point in the future. Uh, and also another question is uh, uh, yeah yeah sure uh, we can sh yeah we we, I, I, we can share the slide presentation uh, of course and our paper should come out soon also on our website. We will also publish the the seminar the as a video in YouTube. We will be notified from it. So. Yeah. Okay. If no other questions come, uh, I would like to conclude uh, the seminar and uh, uh, I want to thank all the presenters uh, for the very interesting presentations and. Um, for also especially most important to stay <laughs> on time <laughs> and uh, to respect the schedule and um, uh, thanks also for the participants I, I saw there are again a lot of uh, familiar names but uh, unfortunately this time uh, in the webinar context we are not able to uh, to socialize so hopefully next year uh, we can already have our seminar in in physical form 
so then we could meet meet in person that would be fantastic um so what to come the next uh, is uh, please don't forget that the payment seminar uh, the economics of payment seminar eop 10th version so the eop x is coming very soon so it will be held the 20 uh, 20 to 22nd of october uh, the registration links you can find also on uh, on the internet pages of the bank of finland and uh, and uh, you have probably been notified by mail, so just uh, you are all welcome. Uh, if you don't know how to register or something, uh, you find it difficult to find, so you can be in contact with us directly too. But uh, basically from, from the internet pages of the Bank of Finland, you can at least find the registration links for that. Another thing is if you are not uh, enrolled to our mailing list, you can do so from our pages uh, again. And um, uh, we will send you a feedback questionnaire. We hope you, you answered the questions. So that will help us to keep track a little bit on, on the satisfaction level of uh, participants. Um, yeah, so I would just wish you a good rest of the day and see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>